Hello and welcome to Motor City here in the state of Michigan, USA. Of course, this is Detroit, the worldwide HQ of the massive General Motors Corporation here at the Renaissance Center Towers with Daimler Chrysler and Ford HQ down the road. The whole of Detroit seems to be one big theme park for car lovers and every January sees the city being taken over by thousands of car industry top brass and designers, thousands of journalists and almost a million visitors to the big show. Oh, and there are more than a few cars too. In the show we'll look at the new BMW 6 Series convertible, the new Mercedes R-Class, Saab's 9.2, a host of amazing concept cars, plus there's a brand new mark of car about to be announced here. Hello, I'm Howard Stableford. Welcome to this Carfile Detroit special. So what, it's just another car show, isn't it? Well, no, if you're used to seeing the NEC show or any of the European extravaganzas, you'll be amazed at some of the many differences. First up, can you see the Citroen, Peugeot or Renault stands? And uh, no, neither can I because they don't sell them here anymore. Then there are all sorts of fascinating cars that are really alien to European eyes, but which are quite normal to American eyes. It's rather like being in some sort of weird but fascinating parallel universe. Every year at the Detroit Motor Show they announce the North American Car of the Year. This year it happens to be the Toyota Prius, but last year it was our very own little Mini, born and bred in Oxford. Well, Mike McHale is the Communications Manager for Mini USA. Are you sad to be giving up your cup? Yes, we are. It was a great year, you know, and you're always proud to win such a great award, but you can only win it one year, so that was our year. Now, it's a fantastic success story, the Mini in the USA. Yes. Why have the Americans taken it to their hearts so well in comparison to the old classic Mini, which was something of an English curiosity? Yeah, you know, they really have. We, this year we sold 36,000 cars. Uh, we budgeted to sell around 25. It's just been incredible. And they're flying out of the showrooms. There are still backlogs. There are still orders, still waiting lists. I think the American market's changed somewhat. It's broadened. You know, you have these big SUVs at the one end. But the Americans now, they seem to be more open to a smaller car, and, and particularly one with personality. So this Mini's come along and knocked them off their feet. And maybe in 1960, they weren't quite ready for Mini, right. but I think they are now. But having said that, they look weird on the American roads, don't they? All that space and things, and, the, and this little Mini careering around. Yeah, they're definitely distinctive. And it's funny because people will say to me, you know, in my hometown, oh, I see them all over the place. You must be selling millions. It's not, it's just that they notice the three cars in the town that there are. They're very distinctive. And the buyers love that. They love to be noticed, they love to be seen, they love to stand out. And Mini definitely stands out here. Now, the Americans have a reputation for enjoying automatic transmission more than the going for the real driving experience, which is very much of a, the, the Mini heritage. Are you finding that they're going for that here, the lazy option? Well, we do offer a very good uh, automatic option. We offer a CVT, which is fun and responsive. And yet we find that most Mini drivers still prefer the manual gearbox. We sell around 30% CVT, which is very low for the States. And you're right, they do prefer that auto option, but not for Mini. They like the stick shift. Chris, I think it's absolutely beautiful. Was it designed at the same time as the coupe or a different time frame? No, nope, same time. That's how you have to do these types of cars. You have to put them next to each other the whole time because there's a lot of influence from one car into the other. Now tell me, take me through the car, some of the design features that you particularly like. Well, you know the coupe already. So um, one of the things that's nice about the coupe is it, it's a coupe. It has a beautiful line to the upper. And when we did this car, we wanted to have a lot of headroom inside but still have that nice line to the upper and still have a big trunk you could access. So to make all that happen, we decided to go with a different type of a top. It's called a fin top. And it allows for a very sleek upper. There are very few cabrios which are this sleek in how the upper matches the lower and really seems sporty. And the help of this uh, vertical backlight here, which by the way goes down, gives right. a nice little uh, refreshing effect of uh, allowing the air to circulate 
helps us get away from the fact of having a large glass area back here, which not only would have given us problems with the trunk opening, but would have given us headroom problems. So in the end of the day, it's, it's a new radical approach for a cabrio for us, but at the same time, it, it offers something very sporty and dynamic without a loss of function. Traditionally, or the trend has been recently for uh, cabriolets to have metal roofs that mm -hmm. retract and disappear. Why didn't you go down that route? Why, why go to the more conventional ragtop? Well, uh, in one of the cases here, we really wanted this to be a, a sense of a premium cabrio that goes along with a, ca uh, a coupe, complements a coupe, instead of the alternative, this is a um, uh, folding metal top uh, coupe. And at the same time, the dynamics of this type of a top, how it folds, how much space it gives you, we decided were the advantage we wanted to go with with this vehicle. So there, um, in the particular case of doing a cabrio that has already its stable mate as a coupe, where you really want to have this sense of pair that go together, it's not often that you see a coupe that's this dynamic, this sexy, but with so much room inside of it, as a cabrio and as a coupe. And at the same time, offers these large engines, gives us an enormous amount of power. And that balance, that's, it really hasn't been there on the marketplace. So I really think we're going to be attracting customers from many sides who want more from their coupes and cabrios, want more space, but at the same time, they want a large car that really gives them a sense that this is a top-end car. Well, it'll look very good on my driveway. Uh, both will look good on your driveway. <laughs> Why don't you have both? <laughs> it's a deal. It's just okay. giving me two BMWs. <laughs> I love this job. <laughs> In Britain these days, you can't just point to a Toyota or a Nissan and say that's a Japanese car because in all likelihood it was built entirely in the UK. Well, here in the USA, Nissan's prestige brand is called Infinity. And Infinity have just launched this, the huge QX56. Now, the talking point isn't so much that the driver could be on one state whilst your luggage way back there is in another, but that this is the first of their models to be assembled entirely in North America. The new QX56 is designed to provide luxury on a truly grand scale, with eight passenger seating and more toys than Santa's workshop. The Americans call the long list of gizmos as ownership enhancing technology and convenience features, but really they're just gizmos. Also at the Detroit Motor Show, we're getting our first look at the revised S-Type Jag, which has been subtly redesigned from nose to tail. It's still unmistakably Jaguar, though. Well, here in the uh, Kobo Arena, I found Ian Callum, who's the design director for Jaguar Cars. Um, new revised S-Type for 2004. Yes. Slightly sleeker, slightly leaner look. How would you describe it? Yes, it's leaner, and what we've tried to do is simplify the car. Um, if you looked at the old car, it has certain uh, masses and weights in it, which uh, almost impose a slightly heavy look to the car. And what we've tried to do is deliberately lengthen the car and make it look slimmer, and make it look simpler as well. I've always felt that Jaguars must look simple and very, very pure. And if I have any comment about the older one, it's perhaps a little bit too fussy. So we've purified it. We've actually got a little extra length as well. You've got to be careful, of course, because uh, the Jaguar has a distinctive look when you make these modifications, not to take away, not to detract from the look of what is essentially a Jaguar. We felt one of the strongest parts of the car was, in fact, the front end. We haven't actually changed it that much. We've still got a distinctive Jaguar front grille. We've actually squared it up a bit. If you look at it, it's actually squarer. Um, and we've simplified the bumper at the front end as well. And the reason for doing that is that that grille is so distinctive and before it was kind of streaming out amongst a lot of details and we wanted to really mellow down the rest of the details so the grill actually had more prominence so rather than um, give it less value we've actually given it more value so it's a good balance now. Where do these cues come from for when you're thinking about restyling a car? Do they come from customers or, or, do, or do you just imagine them yourself? Well I uh, as a designer obviously I have my own feelings about what a car should look like. I'm very much a purist, I like cars to be very simple and that's very much in the Jaguar idiom but we do also listen to customers and um, and let's put it this way, the most comment we got about the previous S-Type was around the back end of the car, and that's where we made most of the changes. Here in the United States, you see Jaguars with the Jaguar on the bonnet, in, as it used to be, the as leaper. it should be. The, the, yeah, the Leaper. Yeah. The Leaper yeah. is actually still on the bonnet here, yes. and that's different to the UK, is that right? It's different to the rest of the world. This is the only country in actual fact we can use it legally. Um, it's not to say it's unsafe or anything, but uh, if you look at some of the, the specific dimensions of the Leaper on the bonnet, of the car, when you add up all the dimensions, it actually technically becomes illegal in other countries. So in the US, we can actually use it legally. And 
And the other part is it's much more of a marketing tool here than it is anywhere else. I think uh, Americans are much more precious about that leaping Jaguar in the bonnet than probably are anywhere else. Yeah, I quite like it myself. There you are, you see, if you want the leaping Jaguar on the bonnet, you're going to have to move out to this side of the pond. Let's continue our British flag-waving exercise with a look at a new concept from Land Rover. This follows on from the styling exercise that we looked at at the Frankfurt Motor Show last autumn, and it's called the Range Stormer. It's fantastic looking and still definitely got that Land Rover look. Well, the designer of this fabulous concept is with me now, Richard Woolley, who's the chief designer for Range Rover. Uh, it's very bold. Yeah. What are the design cues behind it? Well, what the car is representing is a... Uh, is, uh a production vehicle is coming from Land Rover in the near future. So this is a real precursor to that production vehicle. And what's different about it? What technologies are going to be used in this that are, that are new? Um, I guess the, the headline technology is uh, terrain response, which is uh, a very easy to use uh, facility that the driver dials in the, uh, the correct setting for the vehicle when it's um, in any drive, particular driving condition. So off-road, on-road, uh, he chooses the, the, the dial uh, setting and the car responds accordingly. Now, how long has it taken to develop this particular concept and what ideas were you particularly interested in? We started on this, on this concept in uh, February last year and uh, completed it just before the show here at Detroit. Right, it's absolutely stunning. Thank you. And why the name Range Stormer? Well, we, we deliberated a long time over the, over the name. Uh, the range part of the name is a sort of precursor to what's coming. Uh, it sort of positions the car in people's minds. It's, uh, it's going to be a sporty, exclusive uh, vehicle. And the Stormer, um, well, we wanted to create, create a little bit of a, a stir here in Detroit. It's a, it's a really uh, a very competitive arena in which to uh, show a concept car. So we're hoping that we've created enough interest for, uh, uh, for us with the, with, the, with the vehicle. You're hoping it'll go down a Stormer? Absolutely. <laughs> you do worry as a Brit at this show that you're going to be intimidated by all that brash, bright American metal, but there are plenty of reasons to keep your British head held high at this show, and this is one of the best, the new Aston Martin DB9 Volante. The price tag of this beauty will be about £110,000 when it hits the showrooms this autumn. And with a stiff bonded aluminium chassis, it promises excellent ride and handling. Henrik, many people are crediting you with bringing back beauty to the Aston Martin range. How far were you uh, influenced by previous Volantes and DBs? Well, I still think that the DB7 and the, the Vanquish were incredible, beautiful and are incredible, beautiful cars. And of course, also going all the way back to uh, the DB4 and the DB5, which is some of my favorite cars. So yeah, I went back and took a look at that, and I think I wanted to get the feel for, uh, have we maybe lost something in our design today in the way we look at things and the way we always crave to do the latest? And for me, it was about getting a little bit back to those pure, beautiful shapes, the pure, beautiful proportions, and not always try just to be strange and, and do the latest. Now you also designed the BMW Z8. Was this a very different design challenge? I think it's very different because uh, Aston Martin is a very unique brand. It's very exclusive. Uh, its customers uh, are very demanding and it's a quite different clientele. Uh, and Aston Martin is really about understated beauty. I always sort of compare to an athlete in a tuxedo and uh, there's really no other car company like that if you look at an Aston Martin, it's almost the only sports car I would say in the world which offer this level of luxury and this level of attention to detail and, and craftsmanship all around the car from the interior to the exterior. So I think we're in a quite unique position. Well, that's it for part one, but don't go anywhere because I'll be back shortly with lots more from the Detroit Auto Show. A very good evening to you ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Detroit Opera House for a seldom seen performance of La Corvette Arte. You see, not everything happens at the Kobo Centre of the Detroit Auto Show. In fact, Chevrolet have chosen here to launch the very latest version of their Corvette. Let's hope it matches the style, the opulence, the splendour of the Detroit Opera House. Let's go and see. The 
thrill of performance is the heart of the Corvette mystique. We began our march towards serious performance in 1955. That's when we replaced the original 150 horsepower Blue Flame 6 with the now legendary small block 265 cubic inch turbo fire V8 at 195 horsepower. While there have been many great powertrains throughout Corvette's history, including several notable big blocks, the heart and soul of Corvette is the small block V8. And here it is, the star of the show. It's the new All-American Baby. It's a 5.7 litre unit pumping out 425 brake horsepower. And this car is going to be officially available in the UK as a left hooker from 2005. The new Corvette has neat fenders extended fore and aft that extend into the doors, a bit like the Corvettes through the mid-1960s. Who says there's nothing new in car design? Do you know, despite my age, I can't wait to get behind the wheel of one of these things. Of course, the Americans do big and brash beautifully, and they don't come bigger or more brasher than this. This is the Hummer H2, based on the original Army military vehicle. And this one is particularly loaded up with every gadget you could ever think of. It had cost a fortune. Now, Hummer are aware of that, so they brought out a more affordable and more practical version. Did you get filled with envy when you saw Arnie Schwarzenegger roar around in his original Hummer? Well, this machine keeps the styling cues but is more practical. It's the Dynamic H3T, a mid-sized truck that infuses all of Hummer's military-derived DNA into an efficient, refined package and carves a new niche in the mid-sized truck market. But there's competition for our cut price Gulf War veteran, and it comes from our friends at Jeep. This is the Jeep Concept Rescue, and uh, it's been designed for extreme off-roading and then some with its 6.1-litre diesel turbo engine, which pushes out a pounding 325 brake horsepower. This is a real-life Tonka toy and seems to cock a huge snoop to the military-based Hummer, which has been pushing the unbreakable line for years. It's an attempt to look at an, another variation of the Jeep brand. The Jeep is a, is a brand that uh, is world-renowned, uh, has been around for a lot longer than any of the would-be's, um, and, uh, and I think it's a, it's a very successful look at uh, where Jeep could go to extend this uh, rescue capability that Jeep has established for itself ever since the war years. Well, Trevor, the blurb says that it's designed to reach areas of the harshest, most daunting mountainous and desert areas. But who needs it? Well, for, exa for, for example, all the rescue operations people that uh, would need, need that sort of capability. You name it, there are many organisations that would require the capabilities of the vehicle. So tell me all about the slingshot. What's the, what are the ideas behind that? Well, the slingshot is a, a small, fuel-efficient, uh, fun-to-drive sports car. Uh, last to drive, similar proportions to a go-kart, you sit that close to the road. A very interesting, exciting piece of news to come out today from the Detroit Motor Show is that the Dodge brand is coming to the UK. Yes. What's the thinking behind that? Well, I think there are a number of products that Dodge offers and the Dodge brand image offers uh, that, starting with the Dodge Viper, which for some time was called the Chrysler Viper, which is a travesty to most of us. Uh, but we didn't have Dodge brand there, so we had to call it um, Chrysler Viper. But now we can bring some really exciting future product that is coming from Dodge to Europe, because those vehicles are designed to, if you will, be essentially very American in design and nature, but they offer the practicality that the European vehicles will offer. The ME412 is quite an extraordinary story because this has grown out of nothing in just about 12 months. And added to that, you've managed to keep it pretty much a secret within Chrysler itself. How do you do that? Keeping it secret meant uh, it was exposed to very few people within the company because the more people know about things, the more they're inclined to talk. And so we set up a special studio in which we did the clay modeling of the, of the vehicle and we, we, we put two designers in there and, and three design engineering guys and they were kept in, in pretty much in secrecy within the organization that something was going on in that studio. We're claiming the fastest 0 to 60 of under three seconds, 2.9. Uh, top speed is out calculated at uh, 240 miles an hour. 
400 kilometers. Um, uh, we met the weight targets. We exceeded the uh, brake horsepower and the torque targets for the engine. We have the right gearbox, uh, and we have all the uh, uh, calculations and wind tunnel studies done that would say that we have it, all the formula to, to get there. So uh, now we just have to prove it out. Looks absolutely fabulous. Any idea at this stage on price when it eventually works out? No, I only know what this one cost. <laughs> <laughs> How much did it cost? It's very expensive. We don't discuss that. <laughs> well, once again, Chrysler have come up with some eye-popping designs and everybody is drooling over this one, the ME412. Now, if they can keep the spirit of this prototype running through the maze of production processes and then get the price point right, then we could be looking at a future winner. If the legendary Henry Ford were here today, the only thing he'd probably recognise is the blue oval Ford logo. And yet, there are lots of fantastic new cars here this year. In fact, together, the Ford, Lincoln and Mercury brands are launching more cars in 2004 than ever before. But behind all the shiny metal and the smiles of the folks on the stands, there's a worrying financial situation. Ford last year made a healthy $2 billion on car finance, but actually lost a $1 billion on car manufacture. Here in the States, Ford's big bankroller has been sports utility vehicles, or SUVs. Now, not only are these showing signs of going out of fashion, but Ford is being squeezed by very high-quality European and Japanese models. This is the 2004 Ford Escape but in the UK we know it as the Mark II Maverick. It's a shame they didn't keep the stateside name because actually it's nothing like the awful Mark I Maverick. This Escape is a fine and nimble 4x4, but because it hasn't been selling well in the UK, Ford are pulling the plug. The legendary GT40 brought back to life as a modern road car and inspired by the car that thundered into our hearts in the 1960s. Well, this new GT40 joins the Ford lineup of living legends, which includes the Ford Mustang, the Ford Thunderbird, and the 49 Concept. The 2004 Ford GT supercar design really does stir up those memories of the 1960s successes of Ford. And for good reason, both inside and outside, those styling cues are all there to push our nostalgia buttons. Winning the 24-hour race at Le Mans was a key component of Ford Total Performance, the worldwide racing effort spearheaded by Henry Ford II in the early 1960s. While the new and the original share the same mystique of the G40 name, they share not a single dimension in common. It's a bit like the classic Mini and the new Mini. This one is a foot and a half longer than the original and four inches taller than the 40 inches of the original. So really, this should be called a GT44. It's fantastic though, isn't it? This is the Ford 500 sedan. Now, to us Brits, it looks like a, a bit like a Mondeo on steroids with a, an Audi TT roof line. But this is actually something quite special. It started out as just a concept car last year, but now it's been given the green light for full production. And here it is. People over here really are saying that this is a very European-style car. To us, it's true, it looks very un-American. But Ford are at pains to give the message that this is worlds apart from the old world of the Crown Victoria and the like. Imagine, if you can, driving a saloon car which has the same seating height as a mini MPV like the Renault Scenic. This is a car that you step into rather than stooping down into it. The hip point is two to four inches higher than a traditional saloon car like the Mondeo, for instance. And this is the new Mustang, and it's not a concept. After a couple of concepts to test the water, this is the shape of all new production Ford Mustangs in the future. Now, this Mustang has small Shelby-like rear quarter windows, similar to those found on the 1965 and 66 Shelby 2x2 Fastback GT350. But don't get too excited over there in little old Britain because the Mustang is not destined for our shores. Whilst we might lap up American culture, the movies, the fashion, the food, we're a little bit more discerning when it comes to cars and American styling like the Scorpio, the Cougar and the Probe have not proved successful in the UK. Although having said that, I think the Ford Mustang would actually do very well.
But if you really are determined to drive some serious stateside metal in the UK, which are the best all-American cars to own? Why would anybody want to buy an American car? They're big and cumbersome, they won't fit into your garage, parts for them are surely impossible to come by in England, and if you can find them, they must be expensive. And lastly, their great big gas-guzzling V8 engines will suck the fuel faster than a bunch of lager louts out drinking after a football match. People buy American cars for various reasons. They're visually exciting. Uh, some people like the, the sound of them. You get the, um, the howl of the engine and the growl of the exhaust. People buy American cars, especially the classic American cars, because they do represent a good investment for the future, whereas you may spend £15,000 on a, a brand new car. If you spend the same on a classic American car, it's guaranteed to be worth the same, if not a little more, the year after. Another good reason is family reasons. We'll get a guy come buying a car and it, for all the summer he'll take his family out and they go to the shows, events all over the country and thoroughly enjoy themselves. So people buy these huge American machines for very different reasons. One thing that must be considered is the fuel economy. Fuel consumption is not as bad as people might think. Certainly in a car like this, a 69 Roadrunner, then you may drop down into 10, 12 miles to the gallon if you really push the car, but otherwise 20, 25 miles to the gallon. There's different models for fuel consumption, but the more modern you go, uh, the better the fuel consumption. If fuel consumption is really a concern for you, then one of the smaller block engines, maybe up to a 5 litre, would be a good option. Uh, these cars, such as the Plymouth, they have a, a big block engine, which is either a 383 cubic inch or a 440 cubic inch, which is around the 7 litre mark. Those kind of engines are certainly going to drop your fuel consumption. Another common perception is that parts are hard to come by, and being cars that are not regularly available, people will not be able to service them. Most um, competent mechanics can repair an American car. Obviously, the more modern they get, they're onto the computer technology, like any European car, so that can become a um, little bit more expensive, which it is with every car. Being so rare, insurance must be hard to find and expensive. Insurance is relatively easily available for vehicles like this. Most of the insurance companies operate a limited mileage policy which may allow you to do 5,000 miles a year uh, and it's quite possible to get a car like this insured for £200 a year. Because of the limited mileage, the insurance is anything between, say, £125 to £250 if you're over 30. But one major concern must be that American cars are left-hand drive. Surely this must be a factor that's hard to come to terms with. Some people may find a problem, but it's no more difficult than uh, going on holiday and driving on the wrong side of the road. Driving on the wrong side of the car just, just takes a little bit of getting used to. We had a lady come down, she'd never drove an automatic or a left-hand drive, yet she wanted an American car. So we took her out on the road uh, for a test drive, and after, I would say, ten minutes, she absolutely loved it, had no problem whatsoever. So, not all the common perceptions about American cars are true. These really can be a feasible option for us Brits. But let's find out what would be the best one to go for. Uh, you get somebody coming in just wants luxury. They'll maybe buy a Cadillac with all the gadgets on the electric seats. and Then you get the uh, usually young, young guys buying the Sports, the Camaro, the Firebird, Mustang, that's another popular one, Corvette of course. A good model for most people to start with would probably be something like a Ford Mustang from the mid-60s. They're a very popular car, parts are available for them, they're a good size, most people can fit them in a standard single garage. Something like this Plymouth Roadrunner is maybe a bit more of a specialist item for somebody who's got a bit more experience. Well here at Detroit there are lots of cars making their world debuts this year, but this is the first time ever that we've seen a Ferrari first at this show. This is the astonishing 612 Scaglietti which replaces the 456M. Basically the difference is the dimensions. This is bigger so that it's not such a tight squeeze for all the pampered passengers inside. The 612 got its name in honour of coach builder Sergio Scaglietti, who worked in Modena at the start of the Ferrari company. He was a master in sculpting aluminium forms, so Ferrari dedicated the all aluminium 612 to his memory. The Scaglietti has got a strong but lightweight all aluminium space frame chassis and body construction. There's a sexy pin in Farina design on the outside. And on the inside, there's a mid-front layout with the engine mounted behind the front axle for improved dynamics. So why is it called a 612? 
well, 10 points if you've worked out there's a 6-litre V12 power plant inside there. No news yet of pricing, but for most of us, no news is good news, so let's just admire the curves and droop. Now, here's a famous logo that always puts me in mind of Neptune's Trident, but the owner of it was born a long way from the sea. Inspired by the new motorways being built in the late 1950s, Maserati introduced the first Quattro Porte in 1963. It was designed as an elegant and sophisticated passenger car, but with the personality of a sports car. And this is the 2004 version, a 4.3 litre, 400 brake horsepower beauty. Porsche is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the 550 Spider by launching a powerful Boxster S Special Edition. Now the numbers of these will be limited to 1,953. That's right, the Spider was launched in 1953. Porsche engineers have worked hard to enhance the driving experience of this roadster and have loaded up this special edition with all sorts of equipment and technical features that haven't been available so far. Happy 50th, Porsche. It was at this very show in 1989 that Toyota shocked the world by introducing a new mark aimed at the poser set, which we now know lovingly as the Lexus. Well, today they're back with another brand new mark, this time aimed at the younger set. This is the badge that you're seeing for the very first time, and Toyota are calling it uh, Skion, uh, Sion, Scion? No, actually, it's supposed to be Scion. Now, the aim is to appeal to young drivers who feel that Toyota is a, a brand of car that mum and dad drive. But it's more than just a name. Picking up the success from the funky mini dedicated dealers, Scion are going to have dedicated areas and salespeople. There was a real need to not just be gimmicky not be in today and out tomorrow, but have a long-term view and a subtlety and design that would last. In reality though, aren't young people more likely to spend their money on a second-hand car with a famous badge on the front? It's possible. There are a lot of people who inherit their first car from family members or buy a used car, but we've priced the science starting at under $13,000 so that we can encourage them to consider a new car for about the same as they'd spend on a good used car. Well, that's it for part two, but you won't want to miss what's coming up next on this exclusive television coverage of the Detroit Auto Show. This is one of the surprises we were hoping to discover at the Detroit Motor Show. The Chrysler Crossfire has taken everybody by surprise in the UK. Well, now it's lost its top. Chrysler's group head of product development is Eric Reidenauer. Well, I think basically that kind of vehicle, that a convertible is just an absolute natural. They get a real roadster off of it, and we knew when we did the original coupe that the roadster had to follow it by a little bit in order to make sure we could get both of them done, but uh, we thought it was just an absolute natural. It's a great, perfect car for out, in the, uh, out and about. Does it you lose some of its uh, driving, driving and handling ability because it's lost its top? Actually, it was the coupe it was exceptionally stiff because uh, we had basically designed it knowing we we're going to do a convertible. So it's very much very stiff still with a convertible, very consistent with uh, basically a coupe-like stiffness uh, as a convertible, and then even stiffer as a coupe, which gives it even better ride and handling dynamics. Now this is going to be introduced in the UK in uh, May of this year. How do you think it'll be accepted? I think it's a great car. I think it's going to be, again, it's a, it's a stunner to look at. It's got great proportions. It's well-priced, and I think it's going to do very, very well. So do I, actually. Yeah. It's, it is gorgeous. OK, let's move on to the PT Cruiser convertible. Yeah. Now, th this is a great departure in some ways, isn't it? Because the PT Cruiser was that sort of a mean-looking, sort of, a, I don't know, mafia design, and uh, it's changed its look completely, hasn't it? Yeah, well, we, we, it did, and one of the things we wanted to do is try and have some consistency with the look of it, so very much we were concerned that with the top up, it still has and carries very much the PT lines, and, the, and so we don't have it today with the top up, but when you see with the top up, you'll see for a convertible, we're able to keep a lot of that image. And then we think it's a fun car, and it's a car that, you know, really spoke. We had a lot of people talk about it. We kind of did a concept car a few years back, and, and people were very enthusiastic about it. So we said, well, we really need to do it, and uh, this is the result. Wrangler Unlimited, what's yeah. that all about? Just tell me all about it. Two basic things. One is the Wrangler itself is an excellent off-road vehicle, obviously the icon of the Jeep brand and just a great vehicle. Um, the one thing it always was is a little tight. 
for some people. It was great for really tight roads and all that, and it's really one of the reasons why it's so tight. But there's some of our customers as they age and start having children or wanting to bring friends and that, there just wasn't enough room for them. So what we did is we stretched the wheelbase 10 inches, we made the overall vehicle 15 inches longer, put 13 of that in the cargo area to really give you room for a couple of duffel bags and some stuff. And then because the rear seat was a little tight, we were able to add a couple of inches to the rear seat and really give it an overall much better package both for a, a typical Wrangler guy and maybe hopefully bring in a few new ones that today wouldn't get one because of those issues. And then we think the basic Wrangler is still very strong, so those will continue on and we'll continue building both of them because we think there really are two different kinds of customers for those. You're also introducing some very interesting new technology, and I'm particularly thinking about the stow and go technology yeah. for, the, for the minivan, which you've got a great demonstration of uh, just over here on the other side of your stand. Let's right. go and have a look at it. Okay, great. Now, this is a, a, quite a a wonderful demonstration um, you can see it going on in the background D tell me what's going on here and the thinking behind it basically the real innovation is the, uh, the ability for both second and third row to be fully flexible to either be up as regular seats as you see the one coming up now or to be totally hidden in the floor completely in so you have a totally load flat floor so if you're going to get luggage or uh, lumber or uh, four by eight sheets of plywood you can slide them in it fits in there and you don't have the problem of uh, having to take the seats out of the vehicle, but with one touch operation, you're able to lower the seats right in. And then with seats up, you get these tremendous storage bins, as you can see there. They'll come with cargo nets, so when you need to get the seats down, you can pull everything out in a hurry. But at the same time, for your kids, lots of place to put things, and they can have it. And again, give you a lot of different flexibility. There's others that have done it with the third row, but we're the first and only ones to have it with the second row fold in the floor. Time for a little exercise. Try repeating this phrase after me. Honda pickup. I know it's difficult. Try again. Honda pickup. It is difficult because those two words don't really go together at all. Now, Honda did dip their toe into this market with a concept that we saw at the Paris Motor Show in 2000. But this astonishing concept is rumored to be an actual production vehicle. Check it out. This is just the news the big American pickup manufacturers did not want to hear. It was bad enough Nissan and Toyota bringing out tough and stylish machines, but if the reliability of Honda are putting their might into the area too, boy are the Americans worried. But hang on a second, it's not just Honda who are threatening the very lifeblood of America's great pickup manufacturers, their Japanese neighbours, Mitsubishi are at it too. Mitsubishi haven't sold a pickup in the States since the mid-90s when they had the long-forgotten Mighty Max truck. This new concept shows the results of Mitsubishi working with Chrysler to jointly develop a mid-sized pickup truck to be built here in Michigan starting in 2005. A couple of miles down the road from the Kobo Center is a motor show of a very different type. This is the Detroit Institute of Art and it houses the very valuable Daimler Chrysler collection, paintings that have adorned conference rooms and factory reception areas for many years. The Daimler Chrysler collection I think was established in the 1970s um, and uh, they I think started collecting contemporary art uh, quite aggressively. They also have uh, collected modern um, art going back a little bit, but no, the, the real, the real centre of gravity of the collection seems to be what you could construe as contemporary art. Why was a, a car company interested so much in in developing this collection of contemporary art? Um, my understanding is that that they felt uh, that it had something to do with the uh, quality of excellence of the surroundings for their employees on the uh, advance edge of making really great automobiles um, that part of that environment would be having the sort of the challenging art of the time around them. One of the uh, most dramatic, mo best known was their commissioning of Andy Warhol uh, to do a huge piece that looked at uh, Mercedes uh, Benz cars uh, through, uh, th through its existence. In fact he died when he was in the middle of this commission. It was, it was never fully completed. This yeah. was his last uh, This was his last, this was his last work, yeah. 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 Well, this is one of several pieces by Sylvie Fleury, a Swiss artist, and a lot of her work uh, has to do with uh, cars and with consumer society and with feminism. And uh, here we have a piece where she's taken the covers of hot rod magazines, American uh, magazines, we make it 
perfectly obvious in certain circumstances that the cars are in fact not an end in themselves, but a means to an end. There's a wonderful one over on the other side of the room, which is just a, a plastic soldier trying to cross the road, carrying a little cardboard car, but, and, this, and it's such a simple thing, but you really want to watch it for the whole, you want to see whether he makes it. That's right. Well, from my point of view, we seem to be moving away from the obvious car motifs here, but a, a very interesting collection of perfume bottles. That's right. I think it's wonderful. It's so brilliantly colourful. It, it happens to be humorous. Um, apparently, there are places where you can go uh, in Germany and elsewhere, and someone will give you, like a palm reader, they will tell you what your colour is and what your scent is is. And so this, this piece is called Arasoma, and each one of these bottles, 102 of them or so, represent personalities. It could be great inspiration for car designers in terms of colours and, and paint designs for cars. I, I certainly could, yeah. Saab have been something of a, a lost soul in the huge GM family, so now they're determined to stamp their personality on the market with the launch of this, the new 92X, which has been launched with flair and some pretty dodgy driving. For now, at least, it seems it's no more Mr. Nice Saab guy. Are they really promoting aggressive driving? This car doesn't just tell you I'm a Saab. It tells you I'm a Saab and you better get out of my way. Blimey! I thought only BMWs did that. I would say uh, the uniqueness of the car for me is that uh, it gives you uh, a wagon-like versatility, but it doesn't look like a wagon. Saab is launching more cars in uh, the next two and a half years than we've launched uh, in the previous 15 years. So we're in a very prolific period of new product uh, introductions. Positioned below the 9.3 in size, the 9.2X is the first production Saab to have all-wheel drive. They've got this thanks to a collaboration deal with Subaru, who know a thing or two about all-wheel drive, don't they? We saw the concept of this two years ago, and here it is in production form. The world debut of the Mercedes Grand Sports Tourer, or GST. The radical Mercedes Vision GST is a saloon, or as they call them over here, a sedan, an estate, an MPV, and SUV all in one. The Grand Sports Toro will be coming to a showroom near you in 2005. And we think it's going to be called the R-Class. Now, that's supposed to be a secret, so how do we know? Well, a certain designer at Mercedes in Germany called Stephen Mattin had some business cards printed up with designer of R-Class written on them and gave one to a British journalist. So now we all know. Oops. The GST's striking design gives the idea of spaciousness and, and it's complemented with barn-style doors. The interior is as radical as the exterior and the GST features six seats. The Mercedes GST will be produced at the Alabama plant here in the USA. Now it's always nice to bump into old friends of Carfile at shows like this. You may remember Nick Riley as chairman of our very own Vauxhall Motor Company. Well now he's got a very different job indeed as president and CEO of Deu Auto and Technology in Seoul, Korea. I met up with him a little earlier on. We took over a very bankrupt company and we've been able to achieve all the objectives we set for the first year. So we're, we're quite pleased at the end of the first year. Now tell us a bit about the big picture. How does Deu fit into General Motors globally? Well, we're right at the right place to explain that answer, the Detroit Auto Show. Right behind me here, I have a Chevrolet Aveo, which is actually one of our cars from Korea. And in a stand over there at the Suzuki stand, we have two more of our cars that are produced in, in Korea. So we are very much a supplier to General Motors and other parts of the GM family of product, uh, which can hit a certain price point. Uh, which GM didn't have before. Our particular expertise is in the small cars. Uh, we have a car called a Carlos, uh, which is called Carlos in uh, Europe and also in the Far East. But in, for example, in China, it's badged as a Buick XL, uh, and it's the number one car in China. We have another car called the Nubira in, in Europe, which is called uh, Lassetti out in the Far East, and that has just won three top prizes in the Indian market. And then next, moving up next, uh, a Magnus, uh, which is the size of um, something like a Vectra uh, in, in Europe, uh, is also doing very well. So our real strength is in the smaller cars, although we are, we're going to produce an SUV shortly as well. 
Well, we have pretty much exhausted all the news from the North American International Auto Show from Detroit for 2004. Lots of fascinating stories, relevant not just to North America, but to Britain and the rest of Europe too. So from everyone on Carfile, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.